I think some of you have met our fearless leader, Vivek Chinoy, who you are now sort of hearing in this uh, strange situation where you can hear but not see him. We will definitely see him, and I'm sure he wants to meet all of you at the retreat. Uh, right now, he is going to give a talk about the mechanical properties of biomaterials. All right, Vivek, I am turning it over to you. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks, Rick. So, uh... Uh, so as you know, uh, you know, you were expecting to see Dave, but you're stuck with me, unfortunately. So Dave was not uh, uh, prepared to give this presentation. So I, uh, so I thought I'll tell you a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, the mechanical properties of biomaterials. Now, uh, you know, let me see who's in the audience, uh, if I can. Uh, so I think uh, uh, three of you, uh, Dongning, Tonya, and Sijia have taken my course. So this is, a lot of it is from there. Uh, but for the rest of you, uh, maybe seven or eight of you, uh, may maybe this is new. And what I want to tell you about is uh, how we think about uh, modeling, uh, uh, describing the mechanical response of biomaterials. So, uh, so typically, uh, you know, when you try to describe Mechan a mechanical property you're talking about stiffness all right so stiffness basically tells you how hard it is to deform something when you apply a force but uh, implicit uh, in that definition is the fact that uh, stiffness does not depend on deformation uh, so for instance if I pull if I push on something I need a certain amount of force if I in, if I push it uh, you know by twice that amount, then if the force is twice of what you needed uh, to deform it uh, initially, then that's a linear elastic material, meaning force is proportional to deformation. But almost uh, all biological materials are, uh, they differ significantly from linear elastic uh, materials. So what I want to tell you about is how they differ, what the physics is, uh, how is it related to the microscopic structure, what can we learn from understanding, uh, uh, you know, the force versus deformation of uh, biological materials? So, broadly speaking, uh, uh, you know, the materials that go beyond linear elasticity. So, can you see my cursor or no? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so the materials that go beyond linear elasticity can be classified into uh, these categories. Uh, and my goal today is to go through each one of these uh, uh, types of uh, material responses and give you examples of uh, different biological materials that show this response. So let's start with uh, what's called hyperelasticity. Okay. So hyperelasticity basically is a way to describe materials that are nonlinearly elastic. All right. So what does that mean? That means if I increase the force by a factor of two, if the deformation increases by a factor of four, then it is not increasing linearly. So those kind of materials are called hyperelastic. And the reason I have that in green uh, instead of the other material behaviors, which are in red, is that uh, hyperelasticity and linear elasticity, there is no dissipation. If I remove the force, the material comes back to uh, you know where you started from. That is the undeformed configuration. So they basically you can you can basically deform these materials back and forth with no dissipation. Whatever you work you put in, you get out. So that's that's the uh, that's hyperelasticity. Distinction being the uh, material is nonlinear. Okay, and that has implications as we'll see. The next uh, in this list is poroelasticity. Okay, so what's poroelasticity? So poroelasticity is, if you take a tissue, uh, you know, in general, uh, very broadly speaking, you can identify two phases. One is, of course, water. Uh, it, it, you know, a significant uh, fraction of uh, biological materials is water. But the more interesting things are more of a solid phase, if you will, uh, that is sort of uh, embedded in this uh, fluid. And so, uh, poroelasticity is basically a description of fluid-filled 
solid materials. For instance, a sponge. So that's a good example for a poroelastic material. So sponge is made up of a sort of a solid scaffold. You put it in water, it's going to soak water in. You apply a force, you can squeeze water out. So many of the uh, uh, organelles within the cell, the cell itself and tissues, they behave uh, as if they are poroelastic materials. You'll see examples later on. So poroelastic materials are also called biphasic materials, meaning there are two phases, a solid phase and a fluid phase. And uh, you can also have triphasic, uh, which basically means uh, you can have a solid fluid and charges. All right. So, uh, you know, so many other proteins are charged. And uh, so when charges are involved, then that gives rise to electrostatic interactions, osmotic pressure and so forth. Uh, but uh, but I'm going to call basically uh, anything with a solid fluid phase with charges poroelastic. All right. So the next material uh, behavior is uh, is uh, viscoelasticity. Uh, so what's viscoelasticity? How is it different from poroelasticity? So visco a viscoelastic material is one that is solid, but can behave like a fluid, though there is no real fluid. Uh, in, in the system, all right? So this can happen if there are, say, for instance, cross-linkers uh, between, say, fibers, and these cross-linkers can come on and off. When the cross-linkers come off, then the material can flow just like a fluid would. So that's the reason uh, uh, it's a different type of material behavior. Then you have other uh, behavior, uh, behavior such as act active uh, materials, so meaning Muscle is a good example where you can convert chemical energy to mechanical energy. So not only uh, you have to uh, you have to worry about the mechanical aspect, but you also have to worry about metabolism. How are you going to convert the chemical energy? So that brings in uh, you know newer physical aspects uh, uh, with of course biological consequences. And uh, there are other models uh, called plasticity damage. I'll come to these uh, later on. All right. Now, uh, if you are from a biological background, then uh, uh, your, uh, you know, your basic concepts or your understanding of a certain phenomena is uh, basically constantly sort of evolving. But in the mechanics world, uh, you know, these material models are sort of canonical, meaning if you're going to describe a macroscopic response, then pretty much they should fall in this in this list. All right. Uh, you know, if you're if you realize that uh, maybe your microscopic uh, mechanism is different, that's going to change the parameters in these uh, in these models. But overall, the uh, you know the main ideas uh, behind these models uh, they are unique, and uh, each concept is different from the other. In uh, but when you when you sort of uh, you know put these things into modules, then a real material behavior probably is a combination of these things. The so real material could be poroviscoelastic, means it shows some aspects of poroelasticity and it, it maybe shows some aspects of viscoelasticity. Real materials could be viscoplastic, means you're combining this here and this here. They could be hyperporoelastic, meaning you're combining this, this and this. They can be active poroelastic, so meaning you can combine all of these things and the real material response will basically have uh, uh, features of these uh, fundamental ideas. All right, so let's now uh, start a little bit, uh, uh, maybe, maybe start with some data to sort of understand uh, why, uh, you know, mechanics is important and why we should understand uh, 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 the mechanical response of, uh, of, uh, of biological materials. So let's first start with uh, some data on fibrosis. So here, what I want to show you is that uh, uh, the uh, mechanics of a tissue uh, basically evolves uh, with uh, uh, you know, as the tissue becomes diseased, or uh, you know, some of the more biological processes uh, in the tissue uh, uh, you know, is going to evolve. So here, uh, what you're looking at is uh, the fact that uh, tissue stiffness increases uh, in fibrosis. So, for instance, uh, normal liver has a stiffness around 0.4 kilopascal that you can see on the top here, and uh, uh, you know, when in fibrotic tissues, stiffer. Same with the lung, same with the vasculature. All right, so clearly uh, stiffness is a measure in some sense of, uh, of a state of disease. The same thing happens in other diseases. You know, I don't want to go into a long list. 
for some reason uh, i'm not able to advance my slides <laughs> all right okay yeah that's good all right so uh, this is second example uh, where uh, uh, you know where uh, it, 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 uh, i'm looking at the, i'm going to look at the stiffness of uh, of uh, uh, of a, a metastatic tissue so this here is the primary tumor and the cells uh, basically have to escape from this primary tumor move through a what's called the stroma stroma is the uh, you know is the uh, is the extracellular region that surrounds the tumor and then eventually it has to find its way to a blood vessel and then sort of uh, 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 intravasate extravasate and then form a secondary uh, a secondary tumor so here if you look at the stiffness of the stroma that surrounds the tumor in a normal uh, tissue the stiffness of the stroma is 200 pascal whereas uh, in a uh, uh, in a tumor uh, 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 when the tumor becomes metastatic uh, you know this uh, this becomes stiff all right so so clearly uh, you know mechanics is uh, is telling you that uh, something is wrong with the tissue so let's try to understand various uh, ways to characterize this mechanics so let me uh, so uh, so i want to go back to this list and go through each one of these in uh, in order so let me start with uh, hyperelasticity all right so here what i'm plotting is the stress uh, strain versus stress relationship of uh, of a common material uh, that is rubber all right so now if you look at this uh, stress strain curve you know you basically see that it is not a straight line uh, you know this the stress is evolving with strain had it been a straight line this would have been a, a linear material uh, but in this case uh, it's not you know and from common practice you know that uh, you can stretch it up by a factor of what 2 3 5 10 you can increase its length by uh, by, by a large amount uh, but as you keep deforming it what this is telling you is that you need more force to deform uh, this material now let's go to uh, some biological materials and see how they behave. Uh, so you probably saw this in Paul Jamnay's talk. Uh, so here, what we are looking at is the stress, uh, uh, the elastic modulus versus strain of various uh, 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 cytoskeletal networks as well as extracellular uh, uh, filamentous networks such as collagen and fibrin. And actin is within the cell, and uh, wymentin and neurofilaments are also uh, within the cell. So, if the material is linear elastic, then basically you should get just a straight, uh, just a flat horizontal curve, which is which it is in the in this case of polyacrylamide. But if the material is nonlinear, you see there is stiffening. These, uh, you know, these uh, uh, at, at small strains, the material is soft. When you increase the strains, they're stiffer. So, these kind of materials are called hyperelastic materials meaning nonlinear materials now let's try to understand uh, how this uh, you know what gives rise to this nonlinearity so here i'm just showing you uh, sort of the stress strain response of a collagen gel you see that the initially the material is soft meaning when you increase the strain here by 20 percent the stress went up uh, a little bit but then between this 20 and 40 the stress goes up a whole lot eventually the material fails so let's try to understand how we can uh, understand this. So, uh, uh, you know, so uh, Dave was going to talk to you about computational methods and modeling. So this here is an example. So if you want to understand a behavior like this, what do we do? You basically, uh, you know, take a bunch of filaments. Each filament is linear elastic, but then you cross-link them. So everywhere you see here, uh, these uh, filaments are cross-linked and then put it in a box and then deform it all right so as you deform this material uh you see the movie yeah mm -hmm. okay good so as you deform this material what you see is that uh, the uh, fibers that were initially random are now aligning all right uh and uh so so initially the fibers are random and as you deform it you increase strain fibers are aligning and the red lines that you see here are fibers that are carrying a lot of strain so when you shear something uh, you know you align fibers in the direction of uh, 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 in a 45 degree angle roughly and the fibers that are perpendicular they buckle all right and so uh, same thing in tension so here uh, you have a random network i pull it 
if you pull it, you see, uh, you see here that all these fibers are aligned. And by looking at these fibers in the deformed configuration, it is hard to figure out where they came from, uh, uh, you know, in this undeformed uh, configuration. So clearly, uh, there is a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of realignment. And this is what gives rise to nonlinearity, all right? So here, what I'm plotting is the uh, stress-strain curve. And if you look here, uh, uh, you know, for the two cases in tension and shear, at small strains, when you shear this material, uh, these fibers can bend, buckle, and so forth. But then when you shear it a whole lot, right, when you reach this configuration, the only way you can increase the deformation is by stretching the filaments. And if you know that, uh, you know, you take a cord like this, it's easy to bend it and so forth, but stretching it is difficult. So that's what gives rise to this strain stiffening, all right? So, so the bottom line is that the strain stiffening simply comes because of the fact that you assembled a bunch of linear elastic components, but then you connected them and formed a network. And uh, network deformation is different from the deformation of individual fibers. Now, the, oh, uh, all right, I, I just need to, uh, you know, let me just uh, move outside. Uh, you know, my dog is kind of, <laughs> all right, okay, so, uh, so here, what you're looking at is uh, uh, is the mechanical response of uh, actin filaments shows uh, uh, you know this sort of nonlinear behavior where at small stresses the modulus is a constant then it increases but it does depend on how many uh, on the density of myosin motors in the system okay so for instance uh, if you increase the myosin density not only does the uh, the uh, so one thing is clear from this uh, era is that the uh, the modulus at small strains in, will increase, but so does uh, the stiffening. All right. So uh, so the point is, if you account for uh, myosin uh, 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 filaments, uh, uh, myosin motors, because they are actually pulling these filaments, you change the mechanics. All right, and you can get nonlinear response. And uh, so uh, computational models can actually recapitulate this behavior. So here I'm showing you some models where we treat uh, myosin motors uh, as uh, basically uh, force dipoles. Force dipole meaning one myosin grab on, grabs onto this uh, filament, the other grabs onto the other, and then they pull. So when they pull, we can actually uh, you know, recapitulate this behavior that when you increase the crosslink density, which is here, the stiffness increases. So this is the stress versus strain. This is stiffness. So uh, and it also depends on whether uh, you know whether how, how well the myosin is attached to uh, actin and so forth. All right, very good. So I gave you a, a, a simple uh, a couple of examples where uh, uh, where I showed you that the materials need not have a fixed modulus, elastic stiffness or elastic modulus. The modulus evolves with deformation. So in this case, gamma is a strain. Uh, and the uh, the modulus is evolving with deformation. All right. Okay. So next, let's go to the next type of uh, material behavior, uh, which is uh, viscoelasticity. All right. And so viscoelasticity uh, is a simple type of uh, material response that arises because of the cross linkers in your system. Okay. So, uh, so let me uh, let me give you a sense of uh, what uh, uh, you know what viscoelastic deformation is. So let's do two experiments. The first is uh, what's called a stress relaxation experiment. So, uh, so if you look at this figure here, so I have say a collagen network or uh, a collagen gel or any other type of biomaterial sitting between two plates. Then I basically apply a certain uh, a certain deformation, meaning. You know, I shear it by some amount. Shearing meaning to the top plate relative to the bottom plate. So the deformation, there was nothing uh, here. All of a sudden, I apply a deformation. All right. Now, question: If it is a linear elastic material, how, what will the force look like? What's the answer? No, no, no answer. Flat line. Yes, exactly. But because it is viscoelastic, it turns out that the force 
is not a constant, but it relaxes. You see that the force is coming down. All right. So this sort of uh, uh, relaxation is associated with viscoelasticity. And there is a time scale of this relaxation, and that has to do with the viscoelastic uh, time scale. So let me qualitatively explain what's going on in this uh, in this sort of a scenario. So typically, what you have is uh, you have these uh, you know you have these uh, networks that are crosslinked, and the crosslinkers are these uh, red links that you see here. All right, and now uh, now I'm applying uh, you know now you're deforming it. So when you deform it, basically what, what the crosslinkers want to do is they want to break, right? Because crosslinkers, uh, in as you might have heard from my cost app stock and probably from other talks, that when you apply a, a force to a polymer molecule, then the polymer wants to unbind, okay? But the polymers don't unbind right away. It takes a while for them to unbind, meaning uh, if you look at this sort of an energy diagram, a bound state is a, a minimum in energy. The unbound state is also a minimum in energy, though it is bigger than the bound state. It takes some time to go over the hump uh, because there is an energy barrier. There are confirmations that these uh, molecules have to sample uh, in a, aided by thermal fluctuations and so forth that will allow it to go over this hump. So because it takes some time to go over this, uh, uh, you know, uh, to break the bond, you don't get the uh, uh, you don't get a large deformation right away. So when you when you when you shear this, initially nothing is going to break. So the material behaves like an elastic material. It's stiff. All right. Now when you uh, deform it, as these bonds break, the material becomes softer, meaning you need less force to uh, uh, you know to maintain that level of deformation. Eventually, when all bonds break, then you don't need a fo much force at all. And the force can actually go to zero, in which case it's a liquid. It behaves like a liquid. And if the force does not go to zero, it becomes like a, it, be, it becomes it behaves like a softer solid. Okay, so that's viscoelasticity. The other set of experiments you can do to understand viscoelasticity is creep experiments. Okay, in creep, what do you do? You what, what do you do is you apply a force and keep that force a constant. Say, for instance, you take a material and you hang a weight on it. And if, if it is a linear elastic, that weight will stay put. It'll stay where it is. But if it is a viscoelastic material, the material will continue to deform over time. So here, initially, there is a deformation uh, denoted by this jump. And this, this deformation keeps evolving. You can understand this by this, uh, you know, by the same logic that I just described. If you apply a force to this, initially, all these bonds are bound. Then as the bonds get unbound, the material becomes soft. In response to the force, it'll deform more, and eventually you can have, uh, uh, you know, like quite a bit of deformation. All right. So, uh, so I'll skip the mathematical aspects and just show you that, uh, show you some of the, uh, you know, the uh, the viscoelastic properties of various biomaterials. So let's uh, look at the viscoelastic properties of collagen fibrils. All right. So here, you have a collagen fibril that is held in this um, MEMS device. And uh, this is how the uh, you know this is how the uh, the stress relaxes when you apply a fixed amount of strain, and this is how the strain evolves when you apply a fixed amount of force. And from the way these uh, you know these the stress relaxes or the strain evolves increases for a fixed force, you can figure out what the time scales are for this, and those are these tau's. So you see here that uh, you know for different tests there are viscoelastic time scales of the order of uh, 10 uh, like a uh, there is a relaxation time of the order of 10 seconds and there is a relaxation time of the order of 100 seconds and these may have to do with breaking of different cross links now when you take collagen collagen is cross link but there are many different types of cross links so some cross link may break on a 10 second time scale some others may break at a 100 second time scale uh, so, uh, so that's the reason you get these, uh, uh, you know, these kind of be behaviors. And by performing either the relaxation test or the creep test, you will be able to get out uh, these relaxation times. Now, that's for the fibril, but the same thing happens for a tissue. So here, you're looking at uh, viscoelastic properties of uh, embryonic uh, tissue. This is the heart, limb, uh, liver, uh, neural retina. 
So again, when you when you apply a fixed amount of deformation, the force relaxes. And here, if you look at all these materials, these materials also have uh, two different time scale. One time scale, which is the initial fast relaxation that you see in all of these curves, is associated with one or two seconds. And then there is a, a second set of relaxation phenomena that occur over tens of seconds of time scale. Okay, so so what this tells you is that uh, on on time scales of uh, uh, you know a few seconds or ten seconds, uh, you know the solid material behave like fluid material. But when you look at longer time scales, like 120, uh, maybe more than a minute, uh, and so forth. The, uh, you know the force are constant which means it's behaving like a solid okay so viscoelasticity basically is this uh, 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 you know this bond breaking mechanism that is dissipative that is actually uh, descri uh, describing this response okay a any questions uh, before I go to the next uh, class of materials uh, Vivek, this is Rick. I have a, I do, I have a question um, yeah if you have a collagen fiber and you do Grade it with, let's say, a collagenase. You cleave the fiber, but you don't change the cross length. Does that have the same mechanical consequence as removing or adding the cross length? Uh, so, Rick, I can't hear you very well. Uh, but what I heard is, uh, you change the mechanical properties uh, if you change cross lengths. Is that the question? No. Uh, I don't know. Where's the mic? I'm going to move one second. Okay. Okay. Uh, is it? Can you hear me better now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Much okay. better. Yeah. My question is: In a collagen fiber, you have polymers of the collagen of a linear collagen molecule, and you have cross links. You talk right. about the mechanical importance of the cross links, uh, and the you know presence or absence of cross links changing the mechanical properties. What happens if you? degrade the polymer, the linear part of the polymer, which ha which is very common in biology. So a collagenase would not change the cross-linking, but it would cleave the polymer. Is that the same yeah. mechanical consequence? Yeah, definitely, definitely. It will make the material softer because you have reduced the, the net solid component. But in terms uh, of the, visco the viscous component and the elastic component, would those things look superimposable or would there be differences? There'll be differences. There'll be. I think um, my my uh, you know uh, right off the bat the elastic modulus will reduce, and the viscous property will also change, but maybe to a lesser extent uh, by co collagenase treatment. So uh, you know my group has been working on uh, sort of modeling these things. Uh, maybe we can talk more, uh, but it has a bigger impact on the elasticity more than the viscosity. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, other questions. So everything is clear then? Let me ask a question then. Why is viscoelasticity dissipative? So I'm going uh, to pick on uh, Ram's student. I forgot your name. Uh, we met yesterday. Hi. Yeah. So you understood what I said, right? So why is viscoelasticity dissipative? Because um, it can't go back. Why? are broken that's right that's right so that's that, that's the reason bonds can form reversibly too but even when you do that uh, it takes time and you do work so to understand this uh, you got to go into thermodynamics a little bit you know free energy change and so forth also is a confirmation so, so as uh, as you pointed out uh, once you break you know you can't uh, you know uh, you've actually gone to a different energy basin and so you know, when you're basically just stretching, you're in one well, you're basically going back and forth. When you break, you go to a, you sample a different region of your phase space. So that's, uh, that's very good. So, so uh, hyper elasticity, linear elasticity, no dissipation, viscoelasticity, uh, there is uh, dissipation. So this also has consequences. Uh, so for instance, uh, now people are beginning to understand that uh, the viscosity of tumor tissues actually goes up. This has important uh, implications for metabolism. You know, it, so once the energy is dissipated, it has to come from uh, you know metabolic pathways. So cancer metabolism is a major issue right now. Uh, you know, people are trying to understand uh, metabolism of uh, of disease. Uh, and uh, right, and here is a connection between uh, uh, you know between metabolism and mechanics. 
All right, very good. Let me go to the next uh, dissipative phenomena, uh, which is uh, which is poroelasticity. So, uh, so poroelasticity is basically a general uh, description of fluid-filled elastic solids. All right. So the example, as I said, is a sponge. Uh, and uh, so when you uh, squeeze a sponge that's filled with water, basically water can come out. So what that tells you is that applying force has implications for flow of fluid okay and this also is a dissipative process because flow of fluid involves viscosity and viscosity is dissipative but the viscosity we are talking about here is different from the vis uh, viscoelasticity we talked about on the in the previous uh, uh, you know example there the viscosity is coming from the breaking of these cross links here the viscosity is coming from the flow of the fluid, all right? So you have this fluid that's flowing in the solid. That's what's giving rise to dissipation. Now, let me give you uh, uh, some more concrete uh, examples of what actually we mean by uh, uh, discuss, uh, by uh, you know, this poroelasticity. So a simple example of uh, poroelastic uh, material is a hydrogel, okay? So how many of you have worked with hydrogels? All right, so hydrogel is basically a polymer network uh, that I have shown here. Uh, and the polymers in their natural configuration are sort of crumpled, right, uh, because of entropy. Uh, they, they, they don't want to be straight. They just want to curl up, uh, reason being entropy. Uh, because when you curl something up, uh, you know, that has high entropy and uh, uh, high entropy, low free energy. Now, when you put this uh, polymer network in a solvent, what happens is there are interactions between the network and the solvent. For instance, uh, they could be uh, hydrophilic interactions, okay? And once you expose them to these solvents with attractive interactions, the polymer wants to uncoil. And then what, what will ensue then is the, is the swelling of this gel. So the gel volume is going to increase. And so the thermodynamics of this involves a competition. Okay, so the competition is when a gel is going to swell, you are going to increase the mechanical deformation of the polymer because polymer in its natural state wants to be coiled. Uh, but in the presence of a fluid, it actually, uh, it, you know, it, it, it has these attractive interactions, but it comes at a cost, which is increasing the deformation energy of this uh, network. Similarly, when you mix a polymer and a solvent, there is something called entropy of mixing. Okay, so that actually makes this uh, swelling favorable. So entropy of mixing simply tells you that if I have, uh, you know, all the material of one kind versus the other kind separately versus in a mixed state, the mixed state has more entropy because there are more ways you can sort of, uh, you know, have one material uh, mix with the other than have them, uh, you know, if you count the number of ways, you can arrange uh, just two different materials separately or together. You'll see that you can arrange them in uh, uh, you know many different ways when they are mixed so the entropy of mixing goes up so uh, so here is an experiment where you where there's a hydrogel and this hydrogel is exposed to water and over a period of uh, several hours you see that uh, here there are some markers some ink laid in this uh, hydrogel and uh, the material is now expanding uh, right you see that the material and then uh, you can figure out how the size of the material increases with time and uh, so so clearly uh, you know the reason the volume is increasing is because the fluid has uh, made its way in but now you got to remember that uh, you know so uh, when will a fluid flow so what is the driving force for the fluid to flow into this if you have if you want a fluid to flow through a pipe what should you do to the ends Yeah, you need a pressure gradient. So basically, when you take this hydrogel and put it in, in a fluid, there are gradients in pressure that develop in this tissue uh, or in this hydrogel. That is what is actually driving this flow, okay? But when you apply a pressure gradient, there is a rate of flow of water, okay? And that has to do with viscosity. So in a, in a hydrogel, that is described by what's called the permeability of the hydrogel. In response to a pressure gradient, how easy easily can fluid flow? So that's permeability. So figuring out how this gel is swelling in time will tell you what the permeability is. 
important for animal tissues plant tissues pretty much any biological material all right and permeability can also change with deformation okay so so that's the you know that's the concept of poroelasticity basically uh, you know there is a natural tendency of these materials to swell now let's uh, let me show you a few uh, uh, experiments that can be used to sort of measure poroelasticity uh, so here is a, a tissue sample uh, uh, you know from uh, uh, you know from one of my colleagues uh, Kristen Myers uh, at uh, Columbia and uh, so here what she's doing is she's testing this material you know with different protocols so uh, so let's go through each of these tests and then try to see uh, what a linear elastic material would do what a viscoelastic material might do and now we have a poroelastic material how will the poroelastic material behave all right so the first test is uh, you have this uh, tissue sample that is held between two plates and of course uh, to keep the tissue alive uh, it has to be in a fluid so the blue here is the fluid uh, that surrounds the tissue now when you take this tissue and compress it it's like squeezing a spa, uh, a, 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 a chunk of sponge basically the fluid will flow out all right so that here uh, you see the fluid flowing out and what you're doing uh, what you're doing is you're doing this in a cyclic way you're increasing the load you're decreasing it you're you know this sawtooth kind of profile of course this could be a sign profile as well but here in this case just sawtooth and so uh, so what's going to happen is as i push it up uh, the fluid will flow out and then when i'm reducing the deformation what will the fluid do what should it do it should go back in right because in equilibrium there is certain amount of fluid in this tissue so when you push it the fluid will go out when you take the load the fluid should go back in okay and both these things take time all right so so this is one way of testing the other way of testing is you do the same thing but then uh, you ramp up the load so this will actually uh, what, well, the purpose of doing this experiment is to see if this behavior is linear or non linear meaning if i increase the strain by uh, 20% is the stress also increase by 10% is the stress also increasing by 10% that's the purpose you can also do a different experiment where you confine this tissue make the piston here porous and squeeze on it so when you do this then uh, what you change is you change the flow pattern so in this case when you squeeze it the fluid has to flow this way but here uh, the flow is uh, you know the flow basically uh, is not uh, is not entirely uh, it's not in uh, you know in the horizontal direction but vertical direction so what might that tell you that might tell you if there are anisotropies in the tissue so for instance if the tissue is fully isotropic the speed at which the fluid flows vertically and horizontally has to be the same uh, if it is anisotropic then uh, you know then the speed may be different in the two directions so these sorts of experiments can tell you uh, uh you know what the uh, you know it can give insights into the microstructure of the uh, of the tissue all right uh, so now here uh, uh, so i'm going to go to this experiment here and show you what the stress strain curves look like so you see that as you keep doing this cyclic loading okay depending on the you know on the type of uh, tissues uh, you know this the, the, these are cervix samples uh, uh from uh, from uh, you know women uh, with uh, no deliveries uh, you know previous deliveries uh, uh, you know and women with c section you see the mechanics of the cervix is very very different and uh, had it been a linear elastic material this would just have been a straight line but now you see it's not quite a straight line uh, this these curves are non linear and also there is a area under this curve which tells you what the dissipation is uh, where is this dissipation coming from why should there be dissipation you know if it is linear elastic if i increase the force decrease the force you go up and down the same straight line here you see you're going up one path coming down a different path so this area under this curve is the amount of energy dissipated where is the energy dissipated broken cross link what's that the broken cross links no water uh louder water yes flow of water is a viscous phenomena you know if you flow water in one direction it's dissipated you lost that energy because friction between the planes of water okay 
So you lose energy through flowing of water uh, and that's viscosity. So here viscosity is due to flow of water. In the previous example, viscosity was due to breaking a crosslinks. Here you didn't break crosslinks. You, you see the distinction between the two? So poroelasticity has to do with dissipation associated with flow of water in the tissue. Okay. So, so that's, uh, that's basically uh, viscosity. Uh, you know, that's the viscoelastic behavior. And now here, let's look at this particular protocol where you're loading, holding it fixed, loading, holding it fixed. So when you do that, you see that uh, you get curves like this. Uh, when you load it, you know, the material uh, stiff, uh, you know, there's a lot of for stress that you record. Then the stress is relaxing, okay? With increasing load, the stress is relaxing. Now, why is that the case? Can you qualitatively explain? So I'm taking this tissue, I'm pushing on it, the force goes up and slowly it relaxes. Why is that the case? Because it takes time for water to flow. Water does not flow right away. When you squeeze, water, you know, uh, uh, flow of water is sort of a diffusive process. It takes time for the water. Water will immediately flow out from the sides of the tissue, but water from the middle of the tissue will take time to flow, okay? And so bigger the tissue, more amount of time it will take to flow, all right? So, so the point is if I did this experiment on a bigger chunk of tissue, it would have taken more time for the water to flow out. And figuring out how much time it takes for the water to flow and how much time it takes for the stress to relax, you can relate that to the permeability of the tissue. Okay, so if you have a healthy tissue versus a diseased tissue, if you do this experiment, that will give you insights into the, uh, you know, into the nature of, uh, 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 in, into the reason why there is permeability. All right. So now here is a, uh, you know, so, uh, so both, so here I showed you sort of this uh, 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 poroelasticity. And in the earlier slides, I showed you viscoelasticity. Both viscoelasticity and poroelasticity leads to relaxation. The stress actually decreases. Or in other words, the material becomes softer in time. But the reason it happens in the two cases is very different. Uh, in one case, it's due to the uh, cross links in the solid network. In the other case, it's due to the fluid. So when you are going to do an experiment with the tissue, which some of you will uh, as part of the project, then you'll be confronted with the question of, is it viscoelasticity or is it poroelasticity? And how do we distinguish which is which? So the way you do this, okay, this is a bit of a detail and uh, I'm not sure how clearly I'm gonna be able to uh, sort of explain this, uh, but let me, uh, let me try. So here, uh, viscoelasticity has got an intrinsic time scale, okay? So that, that let's call that tau v. So, so if you take a, you know, if you take a purely viscoelastic material, it double its size, and apply the force and see how the, uh, it apply a strain and see how the stress relaxes. It won't depend on the size of the sample because it is intrinsic to the material. You know, there are a certain number of crosslinks uh, or certain density of crosslinks they have to break, so that's viscoelasticity. All right. Whereas on the other hand, poroelasticity has to do with fluid flow throughout the specimen. Uh, when you apply, when you compress the material, uh, apply a compressive stress, the fluid has to flow out. And as the fluid flows out, the material becomes softer, right? Uh, so, uh, so as a consequence, there is a dependence of the relaxation on the size of the system. So basically on the x-axis is time, y-axis is size, and uh, you can figure out uh, whether it is, whether your material is viscous, poro, uh, viscoelastic, poroelastic, or a combination of the two. So I'll just leave it at that and show you some real experiments. So here in these experiments, uh, I don't have the reference. This is from a Nature Materials paper from a couple of years ago. Uh, what these folks are doing is you have a cell sitting here and they are bringing an AFM cantilever and they are squeezing on the cell, okay? And they are applying a fixed amount of strain on the cell. And what you see here is that the force that is required to maintain that strain is relaxing in time. Okay, so if I were to interpret this experiment, then one way of interpreting is that uh, cell has got a lot of actin fibers and so forth. It could very well be due to the uh, viscoelasticity. You know, actin is cross-linked 
and when you def uh, when you uh, uh, you know when you deform the crosslink network, those crosslinks can break. So you might conclude that it's maybe due to the viscoelasticity of this breaking across links, the actin network. The other interpretation could be that uh, uh, cells got water in it. When you squeeze on it, some of the water will get squeezed out. So, so the question is, is it poroelasticity or is it viscoelasticity? So then what you need to do is you need to change the size of your probe, okay, and do these experiments. You have a certain probe size, you double the probe size. To double the probe size, and then uh, you look at how what the time scale of relaxation is. If it doesn't change with the probe size, then it should be viscoelastic. If it does change, then it is poroelastic. Actually, it turns out that in this case, it does change, and turns out that it is a uh, cell is a poroelastic material. All right. Now uh, here, this is a relaxation of uh, uh, you know of a cell also. Uh, but now the testing is done over larger time scales. Here, the testing was done over half a second of time scale. Okay. Here, the testing is done over 40 second time scale. So there is clearly relaxation on very, very small time scales. All right. So it actually turns out that the interpretation of this experiment is this fast relaxation that you see here is due to the fluid getting squeezed out of the cell. That is poroelastic. And the slower relaxation that you see is viscoelastic. So in other words, tissues at the same time can be viscoelastic and poroelastic. Just that in the case of the cells considered here, these time scales are different. So, uh, and using some of the mathematical analysis, we are able to distinguish uh, which is which. All right. Uh, and this is the other experiment that I showed you uh, with this, uh, uh, you know, with this embryonic uh, tissue. So in this case, when you do the analysis, it actually turns out that the, the tissue is so big, the tissue is micron size in sample, and the time you're looking at is of, of the order of 100 seconds here. So there is no opportunity for the water to flow. So basically in the 160 or whatever, uh, 160 seconds, there is no way for water to flow out. So all this relaxation you're seeing is basically uh, going to be viscoelasticity. You got to wait a lot longer for the water to flow out and see the poroelastic effects. Uh, and in these experiments that I showed you, it is it turns out that it is all poroelasticity. Okay, uh, I mean I can come to the reasons uh, if you're interested later on. So uh, all right, so uh, so right now we looked at uh, three different models. Uh, the first is this nonlinear elastic. Second is viscoelastic, which has to do with the crosslink of breaking. Uh, the third is basically poroelasticity associated with the flow of the fluid. A fourth class of models uh, or, or, or a subset of this poroelasticity is what's called uh, triphasic models, okay? So in these uh, triphasic models, basically what you have is you got to account for the fact that, uh, uh, you know, uh, that polymers are charged. Uh, and so uh, when polymers are charged, when you uh, subject these materials to deformation, there will be charge-charge interactions. And also charge carriers also carry entropy with them. So there can be osmotic pressure uh, coming from these charges. So uh, so when you bring in the fact that, uh, you know, there could be proteoglycans and so forth in the collagen matrix that are charged, then in addition to the flow of water, you have to see what the ions, uh, like sodium, uh, uh, in the calcium or... Uh, 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 you know, that are, that are positively charged or chlorine, for instance, is negatively charged. Usually these things are sitting in solution. You got to be worried about what those ions are doing. Okay. So in general, when you, uh, you know, when you deform the material, uh, you know, the, there are going to be uh, protons in the solution. There are going to be counter ions and co-ions in the solution. Counter ion, co-ion meaning, uh, for instance, if there is an acid group sitting on this uh, polymer backbone, then uh, you know it can dissociate, and if it has a negative charge, then uh, co-ion is a negative charge. The counter-ion is a positive charge. In addition, there'll be protons, and there'll be salt ions, and so forth. So you need to account for uh, these kind of phenomena. So here, what you're looking at is uh, so so you, you know we just uh, you know we, we just uh, uh, showed you that uh, you know a tissue can swell when it is uh, in a fluid. Now, the swelling rate actually can depend on the salt concentration in solution. And so, uh, so by figuring out how the salt concentration 
is going to influence swelling, you can actually bring in the effect of charges. Okay, and so this requires uh, sort of understanding both the entropy as well as, uh, in a few instances, the electrostatics or the uh, electrical interaction between these charges. So these are experiments on cartilage. When you increase the, uh, you know, the concentration of salt, basically the swelling uh, 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 amount goes down. And this here is the swelling as a function of pH. Now what pH will do is it will change the concentration of the of the protons. Uh, you know, pH is basically log of the proton concentration. So when you change change pH, uh, you know, you're going to change uh, 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 the amount of uh, the uh, the, uh, the, the amount of uh, protons in there. So, so when you increase the pH for a given, for a fixed gel, uh, you see that the swelling goes up, the y-axis is swelling. And these are different gels in one, so uh, the increasing curves are the more, more and more stiffer polymer backbone. Uh, 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 yeah, so, I mean, uh, yeah, so the top curves are soft polymer backbone, this is stiff polymer backbone. So when the polymer backbone is soft, when it swells, of course, you're not spending that much energy to deform the polymer network. So it can swell a lot. If you don't, uh, uh, you know, if the polymer is stiff, then it won't swell that much, all right? So that's a sort of uh, the, uh, you know, the aspect of charges. So it's really important to account for the fact that there are protons that are also, uh, uh, you know, counter ions and co ions in solution when you're looking at the mechanics. All right, uh, so how am I doing on time, Rick? Uh, you're about done, right? Five, yeah, five, yeah five. I'm done. 